demonstrating how we monitor moths at Preston Monson. Okay, so this is where we set up our moth trap. Um, it's in between our R4 and Recon building. Um, it's just on the fringe of a woodland, an ancient woodland over there. And we have the rest of our site over this way. So it's a good habitat for moths. Um, and we can also gain access to electricity from inside the building as well for the light. This is a Skinner's moth trap, a non-lethal trap for macro moths used to record species ID and monitor species phenology and diversity. Here at Preston Montford, we set the trap up about once a week for recording and monitoring purposes and input this data into iRecord and our personal data system. To set up the moth trap, we must assemble the parts, slotting them into place like you can see us doing here. Okay, so now we're going to put some egg boxes into our moth trap. This is to make sure the moths are comfy and warm, that they have somewhere that they can feel safe, where they can hide. We don't have to put food in the moth box because most adult moths don't need to feed, and some that do feed will only have the boskets of those that do liquids like nectar. So now Anna's putting the perfect slides in to create a funnel for the moths to fall into the box. Okay, so you see we have some plastic bags on the battery and on the uh, extension lead here. That's just to make sure if it rains overnight, which hopefully it shouldn't, um, that all the electricity is safe from the water. Um, and then we just pop the light on into these two slots and um, we're ready to turn it on. We'll be back tomorrow morning to see what we find inside. How does the moth trap work? Well, first we need to understand why moths are attracted to light. One theory is that most moths use the light of the moon to navigate, keeping themselves at a constant angle to the light. The light in the moth trap outshines the light of the moon, confusing the moth. The moth will then continuously circle the light, keeping it on one side of itself. When the moth hits the light, it will give it a slight shock, causing the moth to fall in. Good morning, we're here with our moth box and we're going to have a look to see what's inside. Since it's early February, we're not expecting to find that many moths because most moths don't overwinter as adults. Should we take a look? Yeah, so also we disassembled the light um, closest to the first sunlight um, and we put this uh, bed sheet over it just to make sure nothing flies away um, before we start trying to find some moths. Now we start removing the egg boxes one by one to carefully look for moths. We are picking the egg box up by the top and turning them over, checking all the crevices before being sure there are no specimens in there. So as we expected, we actually didn't catch anything overnight last night. Um, we usually do sample between mid-March um, to November, so we weren't expecting to get anything. Um, but if we were to find something, we have these insect pots, and this is where we will try and get the moths into. Um, we use paint brushes as well. So if I was to have a moth on this bit of egg box, could you please hold that for me, Alex? We would open the pot and gently try to get the moth so, close the lid, not all the way, so there's still a bit of oxygen going through, and then we can take that um, back to our office or outside of the building just to identify the moths. There are so many amazing moths 
that live around us. To start identifying moth species, it can help to describe one characteristic at a time. Firstly, let's look at the shape. Moths sit in different ways and fold their wings differently. This can be a really good place to get started on identifying our moths. Then, we can start to describe the colour and patterns. This moth is mostly green and we can notice two cross lines on the forewings and one on its hind wing. This moth is mostly blue and you can see it has a chequered wing fringe. Can you spot any other identifiable characteristics about this moth? Then we can see this moth has a bold yellow stripe but with mostly grey. By the way it's sitting, we can see that its forewings are tucked tightly in. If this moth were to take flight, we would see distinctive straw-coloured hind wings as it is based on a common footman moth. Colourful hind wings or underwings can be very useful in identifying moths, so make sure to take note if you get the chance. What you might first notice about this moth are the orange spots on the bottom of the wing. They're very distinctive and colourful. These spots are often referred to as kidney spots and can be really useful for identification. They can be different colours and shapes depending on the different species. Some species have many markings. The spots above kidney spots are called oval spots. Sometimes the markings are fainter and harder to see, so you will have to look close for them. Now, shall we have a go and identify a moth ourselves? Are you ready to take some notes? Okay, let's get started. So we can see our moth. It's a brownie, groundy colour, and we've got the bright orange kidney spots on the forewing. From its shape, we can identify it as probably being a noctuid, and we can see that there's an extra spot near its kidney spot. Now we've got our notes, let's try and have a go at identifying it. You can use the web or an ID book or some of the really useful websites we've put in our references. So now we've gone over how to ID a moth or just the starts of it, we'll see how to put them into a database like iRecord. Over to Anna iRECORD is a widely used system for recording wildlife sightings to be used for scientific research. We have our own account here at Preston Montford, but you can use it without an account or with a personal one. So if you click on record, you can either enter a casual record or a list of records, add in a date that you set out the moth trap and enter your name. For the sake of this, we're just going to be putting Preston Montford. Then enter the species that you found and it will give a drop down of all of the species in iRecord system. Then enter your certainty of how certain you are of the species that you've identified. Add the quantity and the sex if you can. This is not really that possible for moths as you would need to dissect them under a microscope. But for any other species you can add in the sex and the stage of moths that you'll most likely catch in a moth trap are adults. You then add the identifier's name, which may be different to the recorder's name. And then you need to set a location. You can do this by clicking on the location in the map or entering a spatial reference. And here we can see our site and we can look for exactly where we put the moth trap and click on it with a 10 meter squared selected. Then you may want to put the habitat if you've just seen something in the wild or if you've caught it in a moth trap like we have, then we would just enter that we've caught it in a Skinner's moth trap and then we can submit. Now that we've got the chance to understand how to identify moths and record them, we can see what some of our data might show us. 
the Rothenstead Insect Survey and the State of Moth Report 2021 shows us that the abundance of moths has been declining steadily since the 1970s. Over the 50 year period, there's been a significant loss of 33% or a third of the abundance that we would have seen in the 1970s. There is no one clear reason for this decline. However, some factors are land use change, light pollution, chemical pollution, and habitat destruction. Climate change is considered to be one of the main drivers of changes in distribution due to rising average temperatures. But we don't know all the effects that climate change is having. The National Moth Recording Scheme showed us that while 37% of species increased in distribution, 32% decreased. So now we've had a brief overview of the wider trends in the UK, we can take a closer look at the trends that we have seen at PM. We have the Rothenstead Insect Survey Light Trap here at Preston Romford. Every day, one of the members of the staff goes out and collects the sample that has been taken and we post it to a identifier who will then identify the moths and use that data ex to extrapolate what moths might be here. Thank you to the Rothamstead Insect Survey for sharing this data with us. We are looking at the data for Preston Montford from their Trap of the Month report from 2020. So this graph shows us the total count of moths at PM from the 1970s to 2020. Uh, this includes um, micro-moths as well as larger moths, which we've previously spoken about. Um, and we can also see that there's no significant trend here at PM, which is unusual compared to the national trend of decline that we see in the previous slides. So if we take a look at the individual species that we've recorded here at PM, we'll actually be able to see some trends, such as the yellowtail and the common footman, which have both significantly decreased in abundance since the 1970s. There are also species like the flame shoulder, the snout, and the green carpet, which have increased in abundance since the 1970s. Mm -hmm. One interesting change that's happened due to climate change is that multi-generational moths, being moths that can have multiple generations a year, are more likely to have multiple generations every year rather than every few years, uh, and this increases their abundance. Research has shown that multi-generational moths are more resilient to climate change than single generational moths. The warming climate means that single generational moths are emerging earlier and more likely to be affected by frost before getting to complete their life cycle and bring in the next generation. This could be one of the reasons why that we see some species increasing in abundance and other species decreasing, but it doesn't tell us the whole story. To find out why, scientists need more data from people like you to help input into their research. If you would like to investigate for yourself, we recommend the State of Larger Moths Record 2021, which is an amazing document um, collaborated by multiple organisations and resources to help provide information on the overall trends of moths in the UK. Also, please take a look at our references that we've provided alongside our video. Thank you for learning with us about how to trap, identify and record moths. If you love moths as much as we do, there are so many ways you can get involved and help. One of the ways is by creating moth friendly habitats or maintaining what you have already in your garden. This could just be leaving the patch to go wild or letting some nettles spring up. Whatever you want, it's easy to get started. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye.